Welcome everyone, I am Abdeshawa Josh and this is Africa Matters. This week we begin in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which the Norwegian Refugee Council says has the world's most neglected displacement crisis. And then we'll head to Lagos, where a ban on motorcycle taxes is affecting millions of people trying to get around Africa's biggest city. And in South Africa, we look at how young people are coping with unemployment, as some locals blame migrants for the lack of jobs. A diplomatic spat between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda has been escalating in recent days, as both sides accuse each other of aiding armed groups in the eastern DRC region. Last week, Kigali accused the Congolese armed forces of firing rockets into its territory. It also blames the rebel group known as the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda, or FDLR, for kidnapping two of its soldiers. The Congolese army responded by saying that the two soldiers had been taken into custody for trespassing on its soil. Days later, Congolese officials suspended Rwanda's national carrier, Rwanda Air, over Kigali's alleged support for the M23 rebel group, prompting the airline to cancel all flights to the DRC in retaliation. On Wednesday, hundreds of people hit the streets in Bukavu, near the Rwandan border, to protest Kigali's alleged meddling in the country's affairs. Meanwhile, the UN says renewed clashes between the Congolese army and another rebel group known as M23 has forced at least 75,000 men, women and children to flee their homes. More than 11,000 are seeking refuge in neighboring Uganda and Kenya. Why can't they just stop fighting so that we go back to our homes, so that we can even feed our children and tend to our farms? Look how the people are living. We are suffering. There's no water and we have got nothing to eat because we just fled without bringing food from home. In their latest report, the aid group Norwegian Refugee Council describes the unfolding humanitarian crisis in the Democratic Republic of the Congo as the world's most neglected displacement crisis. And despite vast mineral resources, the country has topped the list of 10 African countries that face international political neglect, lack of funding pledges, and insufficient media coverage. Here's why. Around 27 million people went hungry last year, or one in three people did not have enough food to eat because of recurring conflict. By the end of last year, 5.5 million people were internally displaced, the highest number on the continent, with a further 1 million fleeing abroad. But there were no donor conferences called to raise the nearly $2 billion needed for humanitarian assistance. Only 44% of less than half of the funding requested by the UN for humanitarian aid was received. In contrast, the aid group says it took just one day this March for a humanitarian appeal for Ukraine to be almost fully funded. Let's hear more from Umar Kabanda, a researcher and policy leader fellow at the School of Transnational Governance. He joins me from Florence, Italy. Thank you so much for making our time to come on the program. Do you think the tensions between the DRC and Rwanda will be resolved peacefully this time around, and how? Uh, thank you for hosting me. Uh to the show today. Yes, to a greater extent, I believe this time around uh, a solution will be created because now it's very clear the combatants and the uniforms of those who are captured by the MONUSCO forces and the DRC army, they are from Rwanda. So in such a situation, we are now not doubting the origins of uh, the M23 and the funders. And in such a way, why I'm saying that chances are higher that uh, today, this time around, a solution will be created is the fact that DRC has just joined the East African community. And by joining the East African community, that is on 29th of March, uh, 2022. So by joining the East African community, it means that now they get into a political integration uh, front and a block Within this block, quite a lot more can happen. And among some of the things that can happen are the dialogues 
which may facilitate new or renew the diplomatic relations between uh, DRC Congo and Rwanda, as well as reduce the rates of uh, insurgencies in DRC Congo. Omar, so based on the fact that let me quickly take yeah. you back to the point you made about the combatants wearing uniforms uh, that links them to Rwanda. Is the uniform a strong enough evidence to connect them to Rwanda, though? Because Rwanda says it's got nothing to do with these rebels. And now we're saying, you're saying that the uniform is enough proof. To a greater extent, I would uh, agree that the uniform is indeed uh, enough proof, though quite a lot needs to be done in investigating more exactly. uh, the forces. And beyond this, we, we also have to understand that uh, M23 continuing to fight for all this long while, coming with new tactics and new weapons. So if they can be able to trace the uniforms and guns, then that means to a greater extent, they can be able to attach the origin of those equipments and wares or clothes to a specific country, and then more needs to be investigated. So to a greater extent, there is an indication of where uh, the forces might be coming from, and more investigation needs to be done to confirm so that more diplomatic uh, relations are rebuilt once again in the region. How do you think the humanitarian funding uh, model can be changed to help deal with donor fatigue? For quite a long time, I've been uh, meditating about this, and I kept on wondering why the humanitarian organizations do not consider the aspect of food waste. Looking at most of the villages in DRC Congo, they are not connected to each other because of uh, the absence of roads, road networks. So I would think that instead of uh, looking at one aspect of food, giving food to the refugees or people in crisis, then if the United Nations and other aid organizations try to rethink how to access or increase food access from people within DRC Congo, mm to those who are in need in DRC Congo, it would create a solution to food as a crisis within the crisis of uh, being a refugee. And in such a way, then we will not be able to find the effects of uh, the global shock created by Russia, Ukraine, as seen from uh, the food products that come from wheat. So if wheat reduces, and some of the food products that come from wheat are the ones that are supposed to go to the refugees, then it means that chances of re getting that food reduces. And considering the aspect of interconnecting food pro producers within DRC and neighboring countries to produce some of the foods that can easily go to waste because of not having access to those who are in need. So that's the only aspect of food. And right. the second aspect that is most important that I, I think I should also mention is there is a strong need for the humanitarian agencies to partner with the government of DRC Congo and designate specific areas to resettle the refugees, not to put them in IDP camps, but to resettle them in new areas where the government has land, reallocate land for them to continue with farming, and in a way it can also increase the access of food mm -hmm. and also reduce the disruption of children going to school and the continuity of families. Beyond this, we also got to realize that COVID-19 is still existing. And in such a crisis, you would imagine that once people get in such a situation, it's very hard to, to avoid the spread of COVID-19 and other diseases. So the re-establishment re re and resettlement of the refugees in other regions of Congo and allocating them pieces of land might right. in a way contribute to a solution that mm. is comprehensive. Thank you so much, Umar Kabanda, a researcher and policy leader fellow at the School of Transnational Governance. Thank you so much for speaking to Africa Matters. We have more stories coming up for you here on Africa Matters, including. I'm Hilary Noruka, and I'll tell you how these motorcycle taxi operators and about half a million others could lose their jobs as the government of Lagos, Nigeria's largest city, begins a ban on their operations. 
In South Africa, 63% of young people are unemployed and struggling to find jobs. And a new wave of anger is growing in some parts of Soweto as locals believe it's foreign nationals taking their jobs, even as uh, the latest unemployment figures show a slight improvement. I'm Naledi Molo, and I'll bring you that story on Africa Matters. Authorities in Lagos, Nigeria's largest city and home to 20 million people are placing a partial ban on motorcycle taxes, which move millions of residents every day. From Wednesday, the taxes are barred from operating in six affluent areas of the city. Hilary Noruka has more. Introducing Lagos's ubiquitous motorcycle taxi, known as the Okada. They are everywhere in the city, weaving through the legendary traffic to get commuters to and from work. An estimated 3 million people depend on Okadas for their livelihood. But a new ban on the vehicles in six of Lagos's biggest commercial districts threatens to leave about half a million of them jobless. Idris Buka is one of them, and he fears his life will come to a halt. If you ban the Okada for Lagos, we are so far, we enter so far, so far not be small. Because this Okada, what will they do? Like me, now they fill my house, I they pay house rent, school fees, everything now Okada. And I don't get any job now Okada, me at the drive. Okay, now if you don't ban the Okada, where I will go? Lagos has always had a tenuous relationship with the Okada. Authorities say the drivers commit crimes and cause disorder. They are already restricted to inner streets in low-income areas, and there have been a few bans and crackdowns in the past decade. Buka has had his motorcycle seized three times. Each time, he managed to get a new one and return to the streets. The ban was triggered by the lynching of a young man in Lekki, one of the more affluent areas of Lagos. He got into an argument with some Okada riders who beat him, stripped him, and set him on fire with everything cut on tape. The tape went viral and led to a citywide outcry. A spokesperson from the Lagos state government says that after this incident, there is no going back this time. This recent ban, I assure you, is driven by the people by themselves. The Russians are saying enough of the tyranny of the Okada riders. They are saying that enough of insecurity. They are saying that enough of, uh, of uh, indecency that Okada constitutes in a place like uh, Lagos. I mean, it's uh, an emblem of uh, lack of civilization. It's an emblem of uh, retrogression. The government says it offers loans and opportunities to learn new skills. But Okada riders like Buka say they have few options. They may decide to operate in the congested low-income areas where motorcycle taxis can still operate, leave Lagos for another city, or take a chance and learn something new. Hilary Noruka, Africa Matters, Lagos. South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world. And while the gap between the rich and poor widens, young people are struggling under growing unemployment and are feeling more and more disenfranchised. Naledi Moleo reports from Soweto. Lebohang Rambusi is 35 years old, and for the past 11 years, she has been unable to find a job. I got a job doing promotional work in 2011, and that ended quickly. That's when it all stopped. I once earned $6 for a month of work. That's when I felt that it's all the same. I kept sending my resume out. At interviews, I was told I would be called back and the calls never came. Ram Musi depends on her mother's social security grant to get by, as does her sister's two children. Four people, depending on one pension grant of $132 a month. For Lebohang, the hardest is seeing her peers progress in their lives while she feels stuck. The Youth Employment Services Harambe Youth Accelerator program says it's seeing some successes, but joblessness is hard to shake for some young people. The good news is that we've gone up by half a million, almost half a million 
people have been employed this quarter. So that's definitely positive and we're very excited about that. I think the bad news is that when you look at people who are not in employment, not in education and not in training, who we call NEETS, then you're looking at an increase of 4.6%. South Africa's latest unemployment rate at 34.5% is an improvement from the last quarter, but that number jumps a further 10 percentage points when it includes those who have simply given up hunting for jobs. Many young people on the streets of Soweto feel the same way. Some South Africans believe they know who is to blame. Look at all the young people not working. Nkantla Lux is one of the leaders of Operation Dudula, a controversial movement proclaiming that illegal immigrants are to blame for the shortage of opportunities for young South Africans. We'll start leading ourselves as you are seeing that we are doing it now because we are leaderless. We are, we just have leaders that prioritize foreigners, be it legal or, or illegal, it's ir irrelevant in this case. We have South Africans that are young, that are without jobs, that are, that are resorting to crime and other elements just to survive. There is nothing else young South Africans can do. 63.9% of people under the age of 35 are unemployed in South Africa. And while the latest employment figures show the first improvement since 2020, the frustration on the ground is still very much palpable. Naledi Muleo, Africa Matters, Soweto. You're watching Africa Matters, and here's a roundup of other stories making news across the continent. The World Health Organization says seven African countries where monkeypox is commonly found have reported nearly 1,400 cases and 69 deaths due to the virus. No deaths have been reported in non-endemic countries, but hundreds of new cases have been confirmed by the WHO in 30 countries where it is not endemic. The WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyeso says the sudden appearance of monkeypox in many countries at the same time suggests there may have been undetected transmission for some time. The head of the African Union, Senegal's President Macky Sall, says he's traveling to Sochi to meet his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, on Friday. Most African countries have been hit hard by price increases caused by Russia's attack on Ukraine. Saul hopes that the meeting will free up stocks of grain and fertilizer that Russia is blocking from leaving Ukrainian ports. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky will also give a video address to the African Union, although no date has been set. According to the World Cancer Research Fund, there were more than 18 million cancer cases around the world in 2020. Population growth, aging and smoking have led to the rise of the disease in Africa. A Ghanaian cancer research and diagnostic startup wants to expand the world's knowledge of how cancer affects African people. Sena Sailan has the story. This small research clinic in Ghana is racing to find treatments and cures for cancer. Pathologist Kafui Akakpo is studying the various kinds of breast cancer that affects black women. According to his research, black women are more likely to develop more aggressive and advanced stage breast cancers. But he says those findings aren't reflected in international studies. Even though breast cancer has been studied extensively throughout the world, the truth is that most of the cases are not um, Africans. If you look at every study across the world, there are very few of them who are Africans. So what this does is that you come to the African population and study it, and that has effects on African Americans and any other group that has a basis in Africa. That's why this is so important. Without it, you don't have enough to um, relate to African breast cancer. Most of it is actually in a white population and not in an African population. The startup Yemachi Biotech is aiming to construct a first of its kind genomic archive of cancers in black people from around the world. Researchers say only 2% of the world's genomic study participants are of African descent, although the continent is home to 17% of the world's population. The reason Yamachi is focused on cancer is partly because no one else is looking at cancer in Africa. 
all our research or majority of our research is focused on infectious diseases and yet we have one of the world's fastest growing burdens of cancer and we have some of the highest cancer mortality rates anywhere in the world so as much as hiv and malaria are problems cancer is a huge problem and it's actually a problem that is growing faster than those other problems Yamachi is one of Ghana's only labs equipped to carry out molecular analysis. Its collected data it believes will advance the development of medicine for cancer patients across the continent and beyond. It is our belief that once we tick off those key outputs, once we demonstrate that we are beginning to advance the state of knowledge on cancer among people of African descent, that the rest will begin to take care of itself. In just over a year, Yamachi has raised around 3 million in seed funding, mostly from African investors. And it's already developed Ghana's first home testing kit for human papillomavirus, one of the leading causes of cervical cancer. Its goal is no less than changing African cancer studies forever. Sena Sailan, Africa Matters. We go to East Africa's economic powerhouse, Kenya, which is just months away from an election to replace veteran president Uhuru Kenyatta. The country's independent electoral commission is hoping to enroll about 7 million new voters before then, the majority of whom are young people. If they register to vote, it could change the outcome of the poll. Octopizo, one of Kenya's top rappers, is taking a unique approach to rally the youth. Daniel Padrick has the story. Henry Ahanga, also known as Octopizo, is a well-known musician in Kenya. He's leading a campaign called Umechukua to encourage people to vote in the August presidential and parliamentary elections. For us, it's giving them the understanding that this is the power, that the most power you'll ever have as a young person or as a registered voter that you have a power to fire and hire, you know, and that's, that power is, has not been told to us. We just think, like, yeah, you go vote, you go home. They don't know, like, it's the biggest power you only have once every five years to choose uh, to move this direction, move this country in a different direction. But years of broken promises, corruption scandals, and vote-rigging allegations have left Kenyan voters disillusioned. Registration drives have attracted about 2.5 million new voters, but it's less than half of the target number, the lowest since multi-party democracy was established in 1992. Many of them, you know, uh, 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 seem not to be very much keen on participating in, in the elections. Uh, discussions we have with them, they, they tell us, you know, they don't see change in their lives. Uh, you know, so there is no point of voting, you vote in the same people, you know. So there is that general voter apathy, which we have seen particularly in the, in the, in the youthful age, uh, who are supposed to be coming into the voting bracket. Octopizo is doing everything in his power. He's even set up voter registration stations at his concert venues, and concert goers are required to provide a voter card to get in. While some fans are willing to attend and enjoy the performance, many aren't interested in the elections. They say the system enriches the wealthy and voting only benefits politicians. I voted in the last election since I had a voter's card and the people who were elected have disappointed us. They did not help in any way. So this time I have not registered to vote as I don't intend to vote because it does not benefit me. Octopizo sympathizes with voter frustration but he hopes his music will move the country's youth to make a change at the ballot box. Daniel Padwick, Africa Matters. This week we explore Tajira on the coast of Djibouti. Over the centuries, the city was governed by the Ifat Sultanate, the Adel Sultanate and the Ottoman Empire, and then France. Let's take a look.
that's our show this week. Please share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshawa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment, and share. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week.